Today we will have Kate Starbird tell us about crowds, crisis, and convergence. Kate is an assistant professor in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering at the University of Washington, and her research is situated within HCI and CSCW. It examines online interaction and collaboration in the context of crisis events. She investigates both large scale and small group interaction online, studying how digital volunteers and other members of the connected crowd work to filter and shape information space. So welcome, Kate. <laughs> So I won't say the title of my talk because it's actually a tongue twister and I, I, I actually probably need to change it. But um, thank you for inviting me here today and I am uh, excited to be able to present my work and I'm excited for the conversations that we might be able to have afterwards when I get to hear about sort of maybe how this work pertains to some of what, what you all do. Um, one thing I want to say, if you have, I, I probably want to take most of the questions at the end, but if you do have questions that you need to ask to clarify things as I go, please do ask them. Um, just prepared for the, be prepared that I might get sidetracked a little bit because um, I really like to answer questions. Um, so I'm just going to jump in and get started. So uh, this is a photograph uh, that was taken, um, gosh, a little over a year, gosh, kidding. my time is going too fast, so a little over a year ago um, up in the northeast after Hurricane Sandy hit. And um, in this photograph, you can see uh, this woman using some sort of mobile device, perhaps to send a text or a tweet or a photo about that tree-car interaction that's going on um, <laughs> behind her. Uh, so, um, whoa, I got really shifted up there in my content. I'll work with it. So in the week after uh, Hurricane Sandy, um, there were 20 million uh, tweets related to Sandy sent. Uh, and um, Instagram was processing more than uh, 10 photos per second in the, in the first day after that event. Um, other, uh, other social media sites were seeing heavy use at the time. And I have been studying this phenomenon for a few years. It was my, the focus of my dissertation research. Um, and my first two years in, at Washington, I've been studying this. And so I got this call from this reporter, and he was like, I want to do this story how it, Sandy is the first social disaster. And I was, and he's like, will you talk to me? I said, of course I will talk to you. You cannot lead with that line. So, um, so first of all, uh, disasters um, have always and will always be inherently social. Um, the huge part of what this disaster is is that it disrupts the social routines that, are, that people have. Um, clearly, they do other things as well, but um, it's, it's very much social. And uh, in terms of social media, which I think he, he was alluding to, um, Whoa, this really is bad. I don't know how that happened. Um, uh, in terms of social media, he, um, this trend has been going on um, for, for several years, ever since we've had any platform that even resembles social media. So before social media, it was forums and other things. Um, people have been using these platforms to uh, share information about disaster events. And this is an increasing trend. I've been collecting Twitter data and other things for years and years. And it just, it, it, you know, uh, the Haiti earthquake, we had three million in three weeks. And um, the Boston Marathon bombing, I probably had three million the first day uh, in terms of the collection. So the, just the, the use and the volume is, is incredible. Um, and so my research lies at this intersection of social computing and crisis events. And um, by social commu computing, I mean social media. I mean all of these tools and devices that help us communicate with each other during, uh, for whatever reason. And I, and I uh, as well as, I study the tools as well as the behaviors that they enable and the interactions that they enable between people. And I look at these in the context of um, crisis events. And by crisis events, I mean uh, specifically sort of um, natural disasters, mass emergency events. And I've also looked at sort of mass protest events um, and some of the interactions that happen around there. And to, to just give away a lot of this in the beginning, um, these crisis events are catalyzing um, massive convergence online. Uh, so after these crisis events, people from all over the world are converging into these digital spaces uh, for a range of different uh, information sharing and seeking behaviors. And um, to be really excited about it and, and pumped about it, I'm going to start out by talking about some of the opportunities for that um, convergence, because there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, this photograph was sent um, during, I came from, I did, my, uh, I did my graduate degree at, my PhD at the University of Colorado. 
And I left, and promptly after that, all of my colleagues who studied disasters and everything else were hit by the floods this, this past fall. And, um, and this is a photograph taken from, from my Facebook stream uh, related to, actually from my Twitter stream, related to what was going on there. Um, and this is actually a photograph of a person seeing this, this, this street get washed out um, and knowing that this is the only street into that town and that they're probably not going to be able to get there for a long time. I think it was over six weeks before they were able to get there um, in this direction. They had to go around uh, two or three hours to get there from another direction. So, um, so this, and, and this tweet was shared initially by a viewer and then a, and then a, um, and then a mainstream media outlet. Uh, posted it, but there's this great opportunity for people using um, using these devices to share information in in real time or near real time with other people, with their neighbors, with media, with emergency response, um, in a way that collectively, if we had a lot of this information, we might be able to uh, have better situational awareness and make better decisions in the moment. There's also an opportunity that many um, uh, emergency responders are using to uh, take. Uh, to take, they're taking the opportunity to use these new, new platforms to um, communicate uh, outgoing communication about crisis events. So this is the Boulder uh, Office of Emergency Management, and they were sending out real-time tweets about where people could evacuate to um, during that event. We saw uh, the Boston Police was sending out real-time tweets about um, different events that were happening there. In fact, their first, uh, the first notice that the suspects had been the suspect, second suspect had been captured after the marathon bombings was sent out through uh, Twitter. That was their first communication about it. So um, emergency management uh, uh, operations are turning to some of these platforms to communicate with the public. But there are tons of challenges related to this information too. And um, in some ways, that's where the interesting research happens. But um, it's also, we can temper our enthusiasm about these tools because of some of these reasons. So um, the, the first one is this, the massive volume, right? So there's so much information out there. Um, that it's sort of hard to, to take it all in at once, uh, individually or even with, with some of the computational tools we have. Um, within that volume, also, most of it is noise during any event. So I talk about there's online convergence. Well, people are coming into the conversation from all over the world, and they're reposting stuff, and they're posting messages of support, and all these other things. So um, when you look at the overall conversation about some of these events, you know, a tiny bit is this, is this live information that we could actually use to help us make better decisions, and the rest is just noise. And so um, to actually make it useful, we'll, we'd have to find ways to, to get rid of that noise. Another problem in this space um, that's uh, particularly bad in social media, but it's, it's uh, always a problem, is lost context with the information, where information loses the connection to the original person who sent it, the time it was sent, um, the place it was sent from, and that can be confusing as it propagates in this space. Uh, so it propagates through reposts or reshares or, or retweets. Um, but an example of that is um, an evacuation notice that, uh, so if you have a voluntary evacuation notice that went out at 4 p.m. in my neighborhood, and someone retweets that a few hours later, and I get, oh, it's a voluntary evacuation notice in my neighborhood. Um, but in, if, in fact, it had already been changed to a mandatory evacuation notice, if I'm getting that tweet from earlier, I might be confused as to which one is true, and I might make the wrong decision. So you can see, as information um, it passes along, it actually uh, doesn't, you never know when it was initially sent, or it's sometimes hard to see when it was initially sent. Um, related to that, um, but also far broader than the lost, lost context, is a problem with misinformation and disinformation um, that is often noted by emergency managers as a reason that um, they're nervous uh, acting upon social media messages um, because of this fear of misinformation and, in fact, the reality of misinformation there. And another problem um, that's uh, really hard and interesting from a computational sense uh, is um, the fact that this data is often unstructured, uh, which means that, um, though, there, though if I consider tweets, and I talk a lot about tweets for uh, reasons that, they have, uh, that the, the platform is very public, um, and so we can collect a lot of data from Twitter. And also, because it's public, people are using it in disasters in ways that they're not using other platforms. Or if they are, we actually, those are private conversations, and we can't see them. So I'll talk a lot about Twitter. But um, Twitter actually has a lot of structured data. But what we're often very interested in is the textual content. And the textual content is unstructured, and it's also um, very short, uh, which makes it sometimes hard to make sense of um, in, in aggregate. And I'll explain to you a little bit what that means. But, so, well, this is going to be a problem because we're going to lose all my titles. Um, let me see if I can get this to look better because I, I have, somehow that got shifted when we 
was not shifted when we ran through it the first time. All right, so this actually says, how can we, um, how can we extract useful information from social media and make usable resources out of it? And so um, this is a question I've been looking at for a long time, is how do we take all of these, this information that's being posted through these different sites, the blogs, uh, uh, blogs, Facebook, Twitter, whatever we have, and how do we process it somehow and make resources, um, create resources that people can use, effective people and responders can use um, in the moment. And um, to kind of give away my whole research from the beginning, and, and what, I wanna, what I'm going to talk about is actually um, this. I, I actually set out initially looking at that as a computational solution, where we, I would develop uh, computer algorithms to help process this information in some ways. And it turns out it's really, really hard with social media data, especially those short pieces of text. Um, because a lot of the tools we have to do natural language processing and other things like that have been trained and actually are very good at long text from the Wall Street Journal and are really bad at um, shortened informal uh, text that uh, fits in 140 characters or even, um, even in a larger post. So um, what I ended up seeing as I went into this space was that the crowd was actually doing a lot of work uh, to organize this information in different ways. And this follows something that we know about disaster events, and I, I'm sure those of you in this area that work in disaster events probably know this pretty well. And that is that sociologists of disaster have known this for a long time, that after a disaster event, people will converge on the scene to, among other things, um, offer help. And they have uh, something, they, they call this spontaneous volunteerism, um, but we know that the first responders on the scene of disaster are um, often uh, not the formal responders. They're often people's neighbors and, and other people. So we're actually seeing this spontaneous volunteerism online, where people are coming into these online spaces and trying to provide help in different ways. And I talk about this as crowd work, but it's also, um, a lot of people talk about it as crowdsourcing, um, which, which has some other meanings as well. Um, and I want to give you a, an example of some of the crowdsourcing of the crowd work that's happening in disaster events. So to give you a, a quick startup, um, so after Hurricane Sandy, so we take, take you back a little bit over a year, there were gas shortages that were happening in New Jersey and other places for various reasons. And people were having a hard time finding gas. And so um, one of the things that people there started doing is they started using Twitter to tell each other when they found gas where it was. So someone who, who had found gas would then make a tweet to everyone else. And they'd put this hashtag on there, NJGas. Um, and so they would share, oh, I found gas in this location. The, the line was this long. They weren't price gouging. But you have to wait, and you have to go around this, this way to get there or whatever. So they were sharing this very, um, this very important information for their neighbors to have. And they would put this is sort of self-organizing behavior. They started saying, OK, let's all put NJ gas on those tweets. And so um, anyone who wants to search, they can actually find this, find this information. So I don't know. It, it, uh, raise your hand if you um, kind of know how Twitter works. If you, okay, I think that's almost everybody. I want to point out one big difference. So if you, if you understand social media, you know, understand Facebook. Your Facebook friends are friends that, um, that you know, and nobody else can sort of see that interaction that you're having. Twitter, the interesting thing is, for the vast majority of people that use Twitter, your information is public. And so people don't have to be following you to see your messages. This means that this kind of the behavior where people start sharing information can actually reach beyond their social networks and reach a broader public and let people sort of organize in the moment. And that's what they were doing, is they were organizing in the moment to let their friends, neighbors, and people they'd never met before know where to find gas. Um, but this, there was a lot of, in, yeah, question. How many people were out there talking about it without, without finding the gas? I, I don't have a way to know that because I, I didn't actually do a study of this. It was actually sort of, um, I'll explain it, but I, I ended up getting into a lot of this volunteer behavior myself. So I ended up sort of participating in this and helping them um, process it. Uh, but it's hard to know who doesn't find the tags. Um, but, there, but people would often like contact people and say, hey, put this tag on your tweet next time and, you'll and people can find it. So there was a lot of conversation around that. And then there were blogs and, and other media posts where people were saying, hey, use this tag. Uh, there's a lot of talk around disasters about which tags come up and how to publicize the tags. But we often do see um, a lot of convergence around the same tags. It's sort of, uh, as long as people understand the space pretty well, they'll, they'll find this 
it'll trend, and they'll, be, they'll see it trending, and then they'll know to use it. Um, but I don't have a way to quantify who doesn't get into that conversation. So one of the things that we saw happening was um, this other, uh, all this information was actually hard to follow if you were on the ground and you didn't have a lot of battery power or whatever. Um, and so uh, this person started an account to actually help other people find the information. So they would process all the information and someone say, would say, hey, I can't follow the whole conversation, but I need gas and I'm here. And this person would um, con figure out where they could find gas and send them the message. Um, send a message personally to someone there to tell them how to find gas. So we see this sort of volunteer behavior where people step into the space and they become sort of a, an information conduit uh, for, for, from the kind of information store to the people that maybe don't have the cycles or the resources to be able to search it themselves. Then we saw a little bit more complex behavior um, where this is actually a map that was created by um, a high school teacher and his students. Uh, they would take, and this is late in the, in the event, but early on it, it looked a little bit different, but they would take all of the um, information they were finding on social media, also information that was being released directly from um, the gas companies and things. They were uh, figuring out wh where places were open and they created a map and kept it up to date of which places were open and had gas and which places were not open or didn't have gas and, and other things. And so they kept this live map going. This kind of crisis mapping uh, phenomena is something we've, we're seeing in event after event after event um, all over the world now, where, where when people find sort of um, gaps in the information response, they'll, they'll try to, I'm sorry, gaps in the uh, response, they'll try to fill it in different ways. And in this case, they're finding these informational gaps and people are trying to, to fill them. Um, so, uh, so we know that um, uh, responders can't, can't fill every, um, the formal ref response doesn't catch everything. And so we're constantly seeing this informal response, whether it was in the physical world and now sort of in the online world to help fill these, these gaps. And I'm going to talk about sort of the different, some different kinds of behaviors. I kind of give you a, um, a preview there, but I can talk about a, a few kinds of behaviors that, that we've been seeing and, and sort of give you a picture of um, what they mean and how they, they come together in some interesting ways. So I mentioned this idea of digital volunteerism, and that in many ways has been the the focus of a lot of what I've been doing. Um, but my first research study actually was, um, so the title says, Volunteers for the ha Haiti Earthquake Response. Um, my first uh, study was of a group of people that were using Twitter um, after the Haiti earthquake to try to help coordinate response. Um, I, I, usually I, I say, I, I, you might not remember this event, but I'm sure people in this room do remember this event, um, the 2010 Haiti earthquake. Uh, which, uh, as a researcher, is actually really hard to talk about because it was, it, um, it, it's just it, being in this space is it, tough. And that, this event was particularly um, uh, horrible in a lot of ways. But there was the, the catastrophic lo loss of life. But in the in the um, aftermath, there were all these huge um, humanitarian needs that um, were initially not being met very well because it was hard to get um, emergency response uh, there and, and organized. Um, and uh, we, uh, when I was at the University of Colorado, were watching this in various ways, and we began uh, to see people using um, using uh, Twitter in in really interesting ways. And we, we at first didn't kind of understand, and we actually went back a, a long time later and and talked to them and and, and unwound the story. We collected a lot of data. We unwound the story and, and saw what was happening. But this is a tweet sent by Melly Mello, and this woman is actually she's now a part of um, the. Uh, Humanitarian, the online humanitarian response community. She's with the Standby Task Force and other things. But Melly Mello, her name is Melissa Elliott. She, she um, is somebody who I've asked many times, but she, she doesn't really want to be anonymous. Um, she sent this tweet, uh, and she says, I'm stunned, have gotten supplies in, saved people from the rubble, brought them doctors. We have the best team. We are volunteers. And later they decided their name was really volunteers. Um, but it, very interestingly, at this point, in, uh, this is, uh, what, eight days after the event, she had actually, um, she actually had never really done any volunteers of any, of any kind until uh, two days after the Haiti earthquake. And what she'd done is, uh, is fascinating. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but um, they ended up actually making a difference in very small ways, in very small pockets. Um, using uh, these online tools to help connect people with information and help uh, eventually sort of move supplies between, um, between places. Uh, 
And so we went and saw some of this, this uh, activity happening, and we, had, uh, and we went back and did a study. So we would collected tweets at the time with the, the term Haiti in them, and um, then we identified this group of uh, online volunteers in many ways because there, our researchers, as we were watching this, couldn't keep our hands out of it and began to volunteer ourselves and try to help and try to move information around. Um, and so we were doing sort of action research in that sense at the time. And so through that action research, we actually identified other people who were acting kind of like us. Uh, and we went back and studied them. We did a large scale qualitative analysis of tweets where we read thousands and thousands of tweets um, to understand what was going on. And then we did interviews with some of these people in these networks. And we looked at what they were doing. And I'm going to try to give you an overview of what some of these people were doing. But um, initially, what they were doing is they would enter the, they would start, um, they'd go on Twitter. They just want to share some support, see what's going on. Um, and then they would start identifying and, and trying to amplify actionable information. And I want to give you sort of an example of what that looked like. So um, I don't know if you remember this, but maybe a week and a half in, the media had started talking about the child trafficking as being a big issue. And so this, this man, Mark Ruin, was actually one of the few Twitterers who is from Haiti, and he was, he was there in Haiti at the time. And he tweets out this thing. He said, I heard that there's some human trafficking going on at this location. And within about an, within an hour, we had, I think, 13 retweets of that information just within this, this network. So I identified a network of about 300 uh, volunteers that I was looking at. So within the first hour, 13 of these people, um, actually, it's, I think 16. My numbers are getting off as I've given this to her. So 16 of those people were like, retweet that tweet. Um, and, we, and if this behavior was going on for any kind of actionable, inf actionable information, people would quickly retweet it, which meant they, they tried to spread the information. We asked them why they did that. I wanted to pass around information I thought was relevant. I quickly identified the sources of good information, the people who meant well but got tricked by hoaxers and tricksters, um, and the people actually in Haiti, both locals, journalists, and aid workers. And so they would, what they would do is they would try to find people who had good information, and they would try to amplify that information so other people could, could, could find it, um, because Twitter is so ephemeral that the, the information sort of dis disappears very quickly. Um, another thing we saw that they would start doing is they got a little bit more savvy and they, they you know, initially they're just sort of mindlessly retweeting thinking they're helping um, or trying to help and, and helping in a very small way. But, um, but later they would try to route information. So they would try to find, um, it, give me give you an example. So this top one probably doesn't help very much. So they, they, they found this information and they wanted to, they decided to send it to Navy News because they knew that the Navy, the U.S. Navy was there on the ground. But clearly that probably wasn't very helpful. But this one actually might have been the second one. Um, they found these other small NGOs that were on the ground. Team, Ru Team Rubicon was one of them. And Team Rubicon, Team Rubicon was actually using Twitter to get some of their information. So people would, some of these volunteers would send information directly to Team Rubicon, who didn't have time or access to be following the whole stream, but might have been able to get this information, whether directly or maybe through a proxy. So they started finding NGOs on the ground and sending them information. They said, you know, by searching Twitter and finding these people, we could send them details on where to go and who needed what. If we saw that they were headed to a particular area. So they were actually trying to keep track of which NGO was where and sort of send them the right information. Another thing that they started doing as they got a little bit savvier was recognizing that there was a lot of misinformation. There was a lot of outdated information that was echoing through the space that was very confusing. Um, and some, so more, some of the more savvy volunteers started verifying information. And then they started telling other people that they needed to verify information. And they started calling out information that was, um, that was misinformation. So they started acting as sort of um, a, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about it later, but an, a censor for misinformation and, and, and somebody who would attack misinformation. And some of them began to act as remote operators. They, uh, Melly Mello um, en ended up connecting to people on the ground through purchasing cell phone minutes for them. And then in the early, in the first few days, she actually um, had access somehow through somebody um, to, to know where the supplies were. And she was getting where people needed things. And she was actually talking to people that she made friends with on Twitter who would go pick up supplies and take them places. That all got shut down three or four days later when the UN came in and, 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 and took control. Um, but for the first few days, she was actually, um, I don't know how, up in French-speaking uh, Canada, um, uh, moving supplies around. And it's become a big part of her life now. She's actually sort of a full-time volunteer. Um, I don't know if, if any of you saw this, but this was sort of, uh, some, a lot of the people that were working on, on Twitter were also participating in what was probably the most publicized uh, online social media sort of effort. And this is the, um, this is the Ushahidi map for Haiti. 
uh, where they were taking information that was shared through Twitter, Facebook, but also through an SMS short code, which is probably the bulk of the information was coming through an SMS short code, going into the system and being processed by volunteers, mostly in, in the US and French speaking Canada, but also eventually all over the world, processing that information and putting it onto a map. Um, and I, we, I don't have access to um, how much it was being used. I know it was used at least a little bit by responders. I don't know how much, but it was definitely an example and I'll talk about this again, about what the crowd can do in terms of processing information. I'm not yet sure that we figured out how that information can be used. There's a lot of questions there, but it shows some of the capacities. Um, one of the things that I talk about with, with this is, it, it starts out, individuals start, start out like working alone, um, but they very quickly be, uh, form sort of what we're calling emergent response organizations. And that's a, an organizational type that actually has always showed up after disasters. We always have you know, new groups of people organizing their um, response efforts in new ways. Uh, but in this case, um, it, was, it was happening online. We can actually kind of figure out the, the network. So we take a network graph of everyone who was talking to each other or retweeting information during that event. And we find this very um, densely connected network. We went out and uh, talked to a bunch of people during interviews about how many of them knew other people in this graph, whether they knew them online or offline before the event. And we ended up figuring out that maybe 1% um, of these connections had existed before the Haiti earthquake. Um, and, after, and almost all of them, 99% came later after the earthquake happened. These people started to connect. They started to organize. The network we found went away. Afterwards, maybe three or four months later, these people stopped talking to each other. And then when cholera came back, when, when cholera hit Haiti a few uh, in the uh, October or so of, the ne of that same year, so 2010, a lot of this network kind of became reconstituted, um, but new people joined in and started, and started organizing in new ways. So, um, and we've seen this network sort of come back in different events. It'll look different each time, but some of the same people come back, the network comes back, and then there's new actors, new spontaneous volunteers. The center of gravity shifts often, um, but we're seeing over and over again sort of um, emergent networks online of people um, interacting and trying to help out with response. And, um, <coughs> Occupy Sandy was a huge part of the network for the, for the Sandy one, um, as well as some other organizations. Um, some of these groups have, have formed into ongoing virtual response organizations where they um, actually have set down infrastructure, whether it's, so we have formal 5013Cs, um, we have other groups as well, but they've set down infrastructure where um, they, uh, they're an established organization that keeps responding to different events. Um, all over the world uh, from event to event to event. And the standby task force is one that um, has been using the Ushahidi crowd maps. They've connected with the UN at a couple different levels. Um, and they've done maps of uh, mostly non-US based humanitarian crises um, and a lot of uh, the um, political violence that's been happening around the world. Um, they'll set up maps and they have volunteers process, process information. So, uh, and, and Ushahidi, U-S-H-A-D-I, A-H-I-D-I, and I don't have it up here. But the, oh yeah, right here. This one is something, if, you, if you're interested, you could look up because that, that, um, that group is sort of connected to the standby task force. Um, we also have crisis mappers and, and different things. But we have these organizations or these networks of, or these groups that come back from event to event to event. And I've done a lot of research with this middle one, which is Humanity Road. And that was a group of people that sort of um, organized during the aftermath of the Haiti earthquake using a lot of that network that I showed you was, were the initial people and, and some of them have fallen off and, and new people have come, up, come on. Um, but they became a 5013C. They put down infrastructure to do, um, to do online information based response uh, in event after event after event. And I did a participant observation with them for about a, a year. Um, and there's some very interesting questions about what it means to be a response organization in this space. And I'm gonna talk a, a f about a few of them here, um, about what it means. So, so some of the harder questions are, um, so these, these groups, so uh, when we have an organization, you, uh, like the Red Cross knows, you know, the local Red Cross knows where they respond, or the, the International Red Cross responds to a certain size event and, and, and is called up for, in specific ways. 
well, these new online organizations don't really have those same kind of rules, and they don't have the constraints of geography, and they don't have constraints of size. And so a lot of them are trying to respond to as much as they can, as often as they can. And it turns out that disasters happen every single day, um, and that it can be very exhausting. So we see these organizations trying to work out who they are and what kind of events they respond to and, um, and, and how they're going to do that with a, a set of volunteers that, um, that in theory, could be responding all the time. And so one of the things that's been interesting is they've been use, using that power of the, the internet in ways that I know traditional response organizations have a real problem with taking on spontaneous and episodic volunteers. They can be um, hard for the organization. There's a training thing that has to happen. Um, and they can be taxing. And the internet turns out to be very good at, at um, mobilizing spontaneous and episodic volunteers, which can actually be exhausting for a lot of organizations, or at least that's some of the research we've seen in, in, in our space. Um, but these online organizations are figuring out some interesting ways of being able to mobilize people from all over the world, being able to mobilize um, people in the diaspora or the diaspora when, um, when something happens in one place, they can actually uh, mobilize uh, uh, people. They can help tr for translation tasks. They can help for geography, for geolocating tasks and things. People that have knowledge of that area that actually aren't affected, um, and so. These organizations have this capacity, and they're and they're learning how to use it because they're just getting started. They're learning how to bring this, use this capacity. They're learning how to leverage that capacity to expand um, and take advantage of 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 the power of the the crowd. Um, I've got some things here about different work practices, but we've seen different different ones of these organizations are structuring things differently. Um, we've got a group out of the Qatar Foundation that's working with the Standby Task Force, and they're. Try, they're taking volunteers and they just send a bunch of volunteers, whoever wants to volunteer during a disaster, they'll send you a bunch of tweets and you can just cl help classify that tweet, say whether it's damage or, or whether it's an injury report or whether it's a need report. And you can classify that tweet and then they take it back and then they, they process it in, 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 a, in a way. It's sort of traditional crowdsourcing if, if any of you have knowledge of that space. Um, but there's other groups that sort of that do it very differently, where they have a bunch of people in a virtual chat room together, and they're all they're saying, "You do this, and you do this, and we'll work together," and and they're um, coordinating, and they're communicating, and they're developing relationships. And there's actually some interesting things about what it means to be a volunteer of these different kinds of these different types, and how we design systems that can both scale up, where we can bring a lot of people on but we give them the satisfaction that, that they're looking for. Or they, we give them what they're looking for. And a lot of it um, clearly always starts out as altruism. But over time, if someone's um, developing expertise and you want to take advantage of that expertise and you want them to be fulfilled, um, there are other kinds of motivations that we have to think about when we're developing organizations, work practices, and systems to support these activities that um, can, can make, make sure the volunteers are being fulfilled as they're doing that work. That's one of the things that I'm really um, interested in as we start taking some of our um, empirical work into system designing, is how to make sure that volunteers are um, being fulfilled in their work. So I'm going to switch, um, switch a little bit for this last part, and I'm going to talk to you about this other sort of, so th these are three kinds of um, volunteers, with or, well, the response organizations um, or, or more of sort of organized crowd work. I also want to talk about this view of crowd work where every person that's, that's online doing anything, whether it's a retweet or a follow or, you know, that little amplification task or maybe they're calling out bad information. Every little, every little um, activity online actually helps to organize the space. And if we develop the right kind of tools, we can actually maybe leverage that to understand what's going on. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit. Um, so we've got uh, uh, this idea that a huge percentage so, of Twitter information. So again, I'm using Twitter often. Um, eventually, I think this will be a different platform. But right now, that's where a lot of the information is, and that's where we can get it. Um, but a huge percentage of, of tweets are what we call derivative information, which are retweets or URLs um, that, that linking to other places um, or um, address tweets where people are talking to each other. And, uh, it, and so um, other social media is very similar. We've, they've got a lot of reposts, shares, likes, upvotes, all of this sort of metadata information. And a lot of these are recommendation mechanisms, right? So um, uh, a retweet can be seen as a recommendation for that information or for the author. A follow is a recommendation maybe for an author. Um, and, and all of this activity together, we see there's, some, there's information within these activities. 
And there's sort of crowd work in the patterns of this massive in interaction. Um, and we've been doing, so, so one of the things we've done, I'm gonna, I think I do have, well, no, I don't have enough time. I'll talk about this one. So we've been looking at misinformation. So I talked about how misinformation is a problem. Um, so we've been trying to track the diffusion of misinformation after uh, the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. And um, to give some background on this space, uh, after the 2010 Chile earthquake, which happened a little over a month after the Haiti earthquake, um, a group did a study of sort of false rumors moving around uh, on Twitter uh, related to that earthquake. And, and in Mendoza et al. were actually doing it in Spanish language tweets that were actually sent from the area that was, um, from nearby the area that was impacted. And they actually found that the crowd spread misinformation. There were a lot of rumors and the crowd did spread misinformation. But the crowd also attacked misinformation. So just like we saw those digital volunteers in Haiti sort of trying to verify and, and attacking information, I talked about that. Well, they found the same activity happen, happening in the crowd after the Chile earthquake. And they suggested early on that we could use this crowd behavior to detect false rumors. So we've been trying to put that in action in a, in a few different ways. So. Um, uh, we try to do, first of all, we try to do a similar study. So we uh, collected 10 million tweets from, from Twitter um, using the streaming API. We identified tweets related to specific rumors. We actually built a network graph to help find rumors. And I don't have time to unpack this, but there's some fascinating things going on. If you knew what was up in that far corner over there, it's all sort of political conspiracy theories. Um, and there are a lot of crazy rumors that are coming out of that. Um, but, uh, between Tico and Obama, it's kind of small, but it's a false flag node. These are all the hashtags that were um, in different tweets, and they're connected. If two hashtags showed up in the same tweet together, um, we made a network graph of them and connected them. So the fact that people are talking about false flags in um, combination with Obama, and if you don't follow Twitter, you probably don't know this, but TCOT is a political hashtag, top conservatives on Twitter, and they use it to drive a lot of their conversations. So, Fascinating rumors uh, coming from over there. There were some other rumors as well coming from here. So we actually used this network graph to identify um, some, of the, some of the memes that were happening and then pull them down and identify some rumors. And for the first set, we actually looked at three different rumors, but I want to concentrate on these top two. One was a, a really, um, I would call it a mischievous rumor, that a girl running in the marathon was, was killed. Um, a girl, uh, it was an eight-year-old girl. Eight -year -old Girls don't run marathons, neither do eight-year-old boys. Um, and, and no one that was running in the marathon was killed. So, and they had a picture of a girl running in a 5K that they accompanied with this rumor that said this girl was running and she was killed. So it was mischievous and it, was, and it took advantage of people and uh, people's emotions and things. Um, and this next one was actually pretty, pretty bad in a different way, but this was a rumor that uh, once the photographs came out of the suspects, um, one of the photographs had a similarity to uh, a, a student at Brown, Sunil Tripathi, who was missing. Um, sadly, he had already taken his own life, but at the time he was missing, um, and people uh, labeled him as the suspect. Uh, the crowd did, and so it was a it was a very damaging rumor, rumor for his family uh, and other people, and, and, and it was pretty sad. Um, but uh, so these rumors were circulating, and and we what we did was we coded it, so we took every tweet that had uh, a mention of one of those rumors, and we coded it as whether it was one of these different categories that we um, had seen. And one of them was sort of speculation, one of them was like passing on misinformation, there was also something in between. Um, but we were really interested in these sort of questions and corrections. So there was this, was it challenging the misinformation or was it absolutely correcting it? So we went and we did this, this study. Um, and knowing that Mendoza et al. had sort of found that just as many people were attacking misinformation as were spreading it, we thought, oh, we're going to see something like that. And this is what we saw. For the girl running rumor, we had over 90,000 tweets that were sending the misinformation. And we had less than 1,000 tweets that were correcting it. Um, so the signal of the misinformation was like this. And the signal for the, for the correction was like this. And we thought, well, OK, first of all, this is really sad because misinformation is going much further. But what can we do to sort of amplify this correction um, to make sure that you know, in the future, um, not so many people are seeing the misinformation compared to the, like if they're seeing the misinformation, that they're also seeing the correction later. Um, for the other rumor, uh, we had, um, for the Sunil Tripathi rumor, it kind of looks like this. I've got some data loss there I want to block out. Um, 
But the misinformation, so the speculation starts out up here, so the red is speculation, and it sort of, the, it shoots up, and then this misinformation takes off when, um, when some people put out a very popular tweet that was completely false about him being officially the suspect. Um, but eventually what's interesting is the correction does catch the misinformation, and that was actually before the media went up and corrected it, because eventually the media does correct this rumor. But this actually does show the crowd sort of doing a good job of correcting. Um, but again, uh, if you're following this in the moment, you might not see the correction. So we're trying to figure out ways where we can identify that crowd attack and amplify it. Um, and uh, so we're looking to use like, crowd work in that way. And we want to develop algorithms that um, detect that correction. And we're working on that in some projects. But we want, we're visualizing the crowd as sort of, um, so I saw, showed you that network before. Um, so this is the network of the Haiti graph. And I want to show you that rumor that I showed you about the child trafficking sort of propagating through this, through this network. If you visualize this network sort of embedded in the larger network of Twitter, if we could sort of nail down where, where this network is and sort of detect, detect when this signal is happening, um, whether it's a correction. In this case, it was an ampl amplification, but a correction of that rumor went through here, too. It just wasn't as broad. Um, if we could find a way of detecting when those networks are lighting up, when they're attacking misinformation, or even when they're spreading good information in different ways, we could develop tools that help us sort of get through the noise to find the signal, to find this information in the moment. And so that's one of the things we're looking to do, is sort of leveraging that, that um, collective intelligence of the crowd to, um, to get through all the noise to make the social media uh, messages, to make these platforms um, actually useful in, in different ways. Um, one of the last things I want to mention, I don't have any time left, I'm sure, um, is some of the big challenges we have in integrating these tools with response. And I don't mention them in this talk very much, but these are the, these are the big questions. And I talk about the capacities of what the crowd can do, how we can use the crowd to find good information, how we can use the crowd to find bad information. Um, but we still don't know how uh, responders, and this is maybe I should be talking to you, how responders can use these capacities of the crowd to help them get the information they need. And there's a lot of studies we need to do in this, this area. In terms of emergency responders in the US, that's something I know a little bit better than humanitarian response. Um, but they have structural, legal, ethical, and political questions that they have to answer before they can really start tapping in to these new information sources. Um, and, and as part of that is you know, this question, and I know you all think about this, is, if we are getting social media data, we're getting social media data from a very small portion of the population. So how do we weigh that data um, against some of the other ways we have co of collecting data um, to help us make decisions? Um, and can we rely on these? It, 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 can we rely on certain um, outputs of the crowd? Right. So we know that we have these capacities. If I build a system that's supposed to take advantage of these capacities or these volunteers, and these volunteers don't show up for an event, what does that mean? What does it mean to count on the crowd to be able to do these things? We know that the crowd can. How do we, how do we develop systems that, that can leverage that and can count on that? Um, so there's, th these are some, some things we have to figure out. And then there's huge privacy concerns and, and concerns about malicious attacks where people put bad information into the system. Um, we've got, I've got fellow researchers looking at Syria, uh, the Syria violence, and looking at the online response. And they're finding um, botnets, which are sort of fake networks that people put a bunch of different accounts into the system, and they start spreading bad information and developing relationships with people, and they think, they think that it's real, and that in fact, it's one person sort of manipulating, manipulating what's going on um, in, in, in bad ways. So there's a lot of um, things we have to work out. Um, but in any case, I, I, think, I, I think there's great potential um, for the utility of social media information. Um, for helping people make better decisions. But there's a lot of work that we have to do before we can make this information useful. And um, my research shows that a significant component of what that solution is going to be um, will probably involve the crowd and in some of the ways that the crowd is already working. But I think we have a lot of questions we have to answer before we can get that done. So thank you. And these are some of my collaborators and funders and different things. So thank you. And I will take questions. <laughs> Yes. In Haiti, yeah, very few. So, um, so I can't tell you what the the number is, 
but I, in, the, in the network that I saw, which was the volunteers, I would say, and they, were con they brought in some of the people from Haiti because they were just connected to them, and that's sort of how I found the group. Um, I would say it was 5%, so it was and that would have been way higher than the actual percentage. So I imagine it would have been, um, I imagine it's on the order of 500 accounts. 500 to 1,000 accounts at that time um, were, were there. And, and that's, that's a guess, but that's from some of the other things I've seen. That seems to be about what it would have been. Far more people from Haiti were using Facebook at the time than Twitter. Um, six months later, much more were using Twitter. But um, at the time, far more were using Facebook. And if they were using anything at all, the vast majority of people weren't even connected at all. Um, if people were getting live information from there, it usually came by a proxy, by what would happen was someone there would have called a friend uh, or a, fa a loved one in another country. Who were, and those loved ones were posting the information on Facebook, posting it on Twitter, posting it different places. So if any of the information was, was actually coming from the ground and getting onto Twitter, it was coming sort of through, through proxies mo more often, much more often than not. Um, and then uh, most of the more interesting things that we saw were when uh, NGOs got there. They were sending information. They were calling someone in the States, and the, someone in the States would post information on, on Facebook or Twitter trying to get um, one of the more interesting cases was a, a hospital that had capacity up in the north and had no patients. And so they were actually using Twitter and Facebook to advertise the fact that they had no patients there. And they ended up coordinating um, with some NGOs there and some others to actually get people, to transport people there um, to make it known that they could, that could actually serve some people. They were up in um, Sacre Coeur Hospital up in, up in the north. So there were some very, there's very small cases, but most of the time it was not anyone posting directly from the ground. The infrastructure was, was down, especially in the first few days. Did you ever see any type of housing formation in places like this? And for example, when the cholera outbreak happened, did that help to chance, like chance of health formation, like cases? Yeah, I would say the best. So when, I was, when the cholera thing happened, and I wasn't doing research myself, I um, was in some of these back rooms where the people were doing volunteerism. And I, Brownstein, I think John Brownstein was doing work in this area, and he was trying to use sort of um, Twitter data and other data to, to see if people were talking about it and where they were talking about it and when. So that's who I would check to see if, if there was anything about Colorado at that time. We did a paper at the University of Colorado, I'm, I'm an author, but not one of the primary authors, about meta tweets. So there were tweets that had medical information during the Haiti, um, the aftermath of Haiti, and we found, um, Lots of tweets that were doing it, and it was a, there was a group of organizations, NGOs, that were um, asking for supplies or talking about um, number of patients and things using Twitter. But mostly, again, it was the NGOs who were, who were using it, and usually through a proxy. So they were calling somebody who was posting it for them. Yeah, so it de there's always a chance when you're running algorithms that you get sort of feedback loops or other things. Uh, we, we haven't yet got, so in the detection of misinformation, I'll start there. We haven't gotten yet to how we would, if we could do it, and, and I think we can, it might take a while, but I, I think there's, there's been enough work and we, if we think we might be able to do it. Um, how you would, who you would give that information to and how, and how that would change things. So if you gave it to every Twitter, you might be able to stop the misinformation, but you definitely change the information space. Um, and, or it actually might not change at all. So there's, there's some, some people have argued that even if they knew it was untrue, a lot of people would have still been sharing a lot of that information um, because sensational information tends to spread. So y yes, uh, the, the design of what we do with that information, what we have once we have it, um, and certainly there's the potential to change the information sharing behaviors. Um, in some ways, you could think about it in positive ways that we could stem misinformation. Um, but there's also gaming the system. So what, if people know those tools are out there, they might start to game the system. So, oh, I don't like this person. So if a bunch of us just you know, put that we think their information is bad, they'll be labeled a misinformation share, right? So um, if the, it, it's just like for spam and anything else on Twitter. Once, once people sort of know how the algorithms work, they can game the system and, and try to take advantage of them. So 
might end up being an arms race at some point <laughs> for some of those things. Yeah, so uh, we, we haven't got there yet. It's, it's in our proposal. We, we want to look at true rumors and false rumors and see how, the, how they compare. Um, the Mendoza et al. study did look at true rumors compared to false rumors um, and found that very few people attacked the true rumors. So there was a big difference in the signal. But we found that a lot of their initial findings were very different from what we've seen. So we're, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that that's going to hold for what we see. Um, but there is sort of a negotiation and a sense making that happens after information's coming up. And I imagine that, um, and I've seen it too, where um, a lot of the, the, the savvy volunteers who keep doing this over and over again will sort of question all information initially and say, you know, we don't know that to be true yet. Let's not share that information yet. That's sort of that's sensational. And some of it will end up being true. So there may be, inform there may be sort of uh, that's not confirmed type activity around true rumors as well as false rumors. But we're hoping to include that in our, in our models. Hoping. Yes? Uh, it seems like before social media, one of the major needs in the US was to just people finding each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, can you talk about that as a. But it's huge. Yeah, it's, it, that's huge. That's probably, I mean, if we look at uh, how Craigslist was, Craigslist was used after Hurricane Katrina, it was finding, finding, finding loved ones was one of the main ways. Um, always, like, I, I didn't talk about the different categories of, of how people shape information, but um, uh, saying that I'm okay or asking if someone is okay is like the first thing that most people do. Um, in some of our studies, like uh, before I got to Colorado, my colleagues did a study of Facebook use after the Virginia Tech shootings, and, and they watched how people sort of t uh, developed lists of who was okay and who wasn't. Who, who hadn't said they were okay yet and, and developed these lists of, of who was, was, was injured and who was killed. So we do, we do see that behavior all the time. It's one of the primary things. So I would say um, uh, missing or, or tr uh, status reports on are you okay, um, need, immediate needs, trapped, if, if people are trapped, transportation and roads. Are a huge one, and that, like for Hurricane Sandy, transportation and roads were like the main, um, the main category initially. Yeah, stranger, stranger. Often, yeah, right. So yeah, the, the, and super, well, um, we find when someone's looking for someone who's missing. So after the Christchurch infra, uh, earthquake, a lot of people were looking for people that were missing, and and using Twitter because it it was a, people were were using that platform there. Um, first, you go to your text message, then you go to Facebook, and it's only after you haven't found that person that you go to sort of Twitter and say, hey, you know, have you seen this person? Here's a photograph. Um, at other events where people get, get separated, they'll start asking, hey, my aunt lives on this street. Can somebody go check on her and, and tweet me back? Um, that, kind of, that kind of thing will happen as well. So it's sort of like, I don't, I don't think you look at, for your loved one on Twitter first. I think you look for your loved one on Twitter second or third. For, for putting that they were okay. Yeah. He just put them. Wow. It's fascinating. I mean, so much of it is, um, so much of what we know in terms of social media is very anecdotal because we can see the social media record very well. We can study that. But we have a hard time figuring out what happened afterwards. Um, so it's hard to trace some of the outcomes. Um, and that's something we have to do a better job of, and it, it's, it, but it's, it's, it's tough. Um, it's very easy to collect Twitter data and, and see these things. It's very hard to come and aggregate those stories across you know, a thousand people to say, oh, here's my quantitative results. Um, but I have a lot of anecdotes like that, and I'll add that one to my anecdotes. So I have a lot of anecdotes like that, but um, for people that want quantifiable outcomes, it's, it's still very hard um, to do. Yes? So I'm not as familiar as what's, uh, with what's going on in the humanitarian response world. Um, 
So I don't know the International Red Cross that well. I do know the American Red Cross, what the American Red Cross is doing for social media stuff. Um, I know that they've been trying to uh, give trainings. They've been trying to connect with digital volunteers. Um, they've been trying to sort of use their social media, and I, d I don't know what the American Red, uh, sorry, the International Red Cross is doing quite as well. Um, but uh, I know there's, it's, it's still coming, right? Like people are, are I, I don't, I think even after the Haiti earthquake, you know, Twitter was, what's that, why would anyone use it? it just, you know, why would I want to know what you had for breakfast and things? And a lot of these activities were, um, a lot of the digital volunteer activities I have are far ahead of what emergency response and humanitarian response has been capable of doing. Um, partially just because of the structural, you know, inertia of, of rules and procedures and everything else, right? Um, and they're just, they're, I know emergency responders, the local ones and ones in the U.S. are just moving into it, and I imagine the humanitarian responders are as well. I know the U.N. Has, is moving to connect with some of these digital volunteer groups in more formal wise ways, but I don't have all of that, I don't have all of that worked out. Yes? Do you have any thoughts as to why the um, correction I think we look, collected our data differently. I think that's part of it. I think um, they looked at, at, at just people that were local. We looked at the whole broader response. Um, and I think Twitter is different now than it was then, too. And, and I, I think they were looking at um, the, the people that were in that time zone that had listed the time zone of where the earthquake was as their primary time zone, or that, that city. So they were mostly in Chile. And they, um, and it was not, uh, it, it wasn't as, as, the adoption rates were so much lower back then. It was a very small group of people um, compared to what we have now. And I, I, I imagine that theirs was on the, on the order of ten, tens of thousands of users, and ours is on the order of a million different users that were involved. And I think the anonymity might have even been different with that. So I think it's a sampling difference, um, but I, I think when we, that when we think about these kinds of things and misinformation, I think that sampling difference is important. And when you look at, I mean, it, for all Twitter data analysis, you, you, however you cut your sample makes a huge difference in what you see. And, and I think that's, that's the case here. Um, but I think it's important to know that this misinformation is echoing so far and so fast and, and often keeps going after the correction stops. A lot of these rumors I didn't quite show you, but a lot of them will, the initial rumor actually, some of them, the false flag ones, the conspiracy theory ones are still going. Um, so I didn't know if you realized this, but it was an inside job. The Boston Marathon bombings <laughs> were an inside job. So <laughs> uh, it's actually kind of depressing to study some of this. In many ways, it's depressing. But for some reason, the misinformation is, can, can be some of the most depressing. But. One more quick question, and then or you want to be done. One more quick question. Um, earthquake in rural China is going to appear on Sino Weibo, which is the Chinese microblogging platform. And it has probably more users than Twitter, or close. And they, um, it's a very different platform because uh, there's a lot of um, government control of how it's shaped. And you can even get in trouble for sharing this information on Sino Weibo. Um, but uh, they have their own. And, and it's actually, there's a lot of research being done by um, Chinese-speaking researchers, most of them in China, about that, which is very interesting because there's similarities and then very interesting differences just on very subtle, um, subtle differences in the structure of the platforms and how information is shared. But a lot of the research that I cite about how people self-organize online after disaster events um, comes from, from China and the earthquakes that have happened there. So the same sort of behavior of self-organizing is happening. It's just happening on, on different platforms in slightly different ways. Um, for languages that for other places that aren't connected, clearly it's not. But for people that are connected, um, it's, it's happening all over the world. Thank you.